On today's podcast, we talk with a very, very good friend of mine, Tyler Bacon. I've known Tyler for over 20 years, and it was really a wonderful conversation. Tyler came out here to California from Tennessee in, I believe, 1999-2000 and built his company from the ground up. He's now the CEO of one of the biggest independent music companies, Position Music. It really is the definition of a 21st century music company. They do publishing, they do administration, they do A&R, they also provide label services and a lot of other services. He has built the company, I believe, to... 20 people that work for him now. It's it's really a great conversation about the market, about what people look for, about the different kinds of uh, services he provides, and he sheds a lot of insight into the marketplace of today. I think you're going to want to hear what he has to say. Insiders, are you ready? Welcome to Mubu TV's Insider Podcast, where our mission is to educate, empower, and engage artists and music business professionals who are dedicated to having a successful career in the new music industry. Here are your hosts, Rich Ezra and Eric Knight. Welcome back, Insiders, to another episode of the Mubu TV Insider Podcast, where our mission is to educate, empower, and engage your music career. On today's episode, we sat down with the CEO of a truly 21st century music company, Tyler Bacon of Position Music. We discussed his journey from Tennessee to California 20 years ago and the formation and building of Position Music, starting out as a one-man company to over 20 people today. How sync trailers were foundational to Position's music music's growth, and how now the company offers five distinct services in synchronization and licensing, a r administration, label services, artist management, and much, much more. You won't want to miss it. But first, a word from our sponsor. Hey, insiders. Are you looking to take your music career to the next level? Then you need to know about the Music Business Registry. The Music Business Registry is the leading music industry publisher of the most up-to-date contact information for major and independent record label a r music publishers, artist managers, music attorneys, music supervisors, and much, much more. The Music Business Registry is the trusted industry standard and source serving the music business community for over 28 years with the most accurate and up-to-date contact information available. Their titles include the a r Registry, the Film and Television Music Monthly, the Music Publisher Registry, and the Music Attorney Registry. All of their publications are available in print, PDF, CSV, or online subscription. Visit them now at musicregistry.com and receive a 10% discount by using coupon code MUBUTV10 at checkout. That's musicregistry.com, coupon code MUBUTV10. When you're ready to put your music to work, musicregistry.com. Welcome back, Insiders. This week's featured interview is with a good friend of mine, Tyler Bacon. Now, if there ever was a lesson or a example that I could give you of entrepreneurship and building a 21st century music company, it's Tyler Bacon and Position Music. I have known Tyler for over 20 years. I knew him when he lived in Tennessee, and he was working, I think, for some music company or a guitar manufacturer or something. And then he came to California, and he just, he built position music, you know, step by step, you know, just getting in it and just deep diving and learning, you know, and it was such an interesting kind of thing to watch because it was just him and then it was him and another person and then it was him and, you know, two more people and three more people. And now he's got a staff of like, you know, 40 people that work at position music, you know, he just hired two other people. It's a growing company. It's a big company, a successful company, and it's in all areas. It's in music publishing. It's in sync. It's in R A and R it's in label services, marketing. Absolutely. All of it, which is the definition of a true 21st century music company. So, you know, he, we had a great conversation about what that took, but what position does and about, you know, the strengths and about, you know, the different elements of not only sync, but of the artists that he's been involved with as well. Yeah. I mean, I really like Tyler because he's just such a hard worker and it's really nice to see good people and good things happening to good people. And he deserves all the success that he's getting over a position. I mean, this guy has busted his ass uh, to get where he's at and it's well-deserved. You know, uh, I thought some of the interesting things were in this was, you know, finding the talent, you know, in terms of getting all this stuff 
placed into film and television, you know, uh, surrounding yourself with the uh, talent to, to get these uh, placements done. And, and, you know, and I thought one of the other uh, good things about great things about this interview was how did he develop those relationships? Uh, I mean, he, I think he early on had some uh, big success with trailers with like on Harry Very Potter. Big, yes. And I forget what the other one was now, but I mean, you know, he had some big, big success early on. And, you know, I, I thought one of the other points was, you know, uh, that we talked about was, you know, if breaking an artist today was a worldwide effort and if, and if so, does that pose a challenge? Um, so, yeah. you know, many, many different areas and, you know, uh, Tyler to me is just uniquely positioned, uh, in the marketplace today to, to do great things. Absolutely. And he has done great things. I mean, you know, he's talked about, you know, how those records and, and he's, and he talks about, to your point about the international marketplace and what's required. Yeah. And, and, you know, and I believe he's, you know, he's broken a couple of acts. So, you know, it's really, really, uh, an interesting, uh, company and an interesting interview and so with that insiders please sit back relax and enjoy our conversation with tyler bacon tyler thank you so much for joining us i really appreciate it yeah absolutely happy to do this i want to start off the question at the beginning is which is do you remember when in your life that you made the decision that music was going to be your career path well i don't know if i knew it was going to be my career path but i remember I was going to school at Mankato State in Minnesota and no clue what I'm going to do. And I came across Mix Magazine and I was a big music fan and I'm reading and, you know, I was like, I don't know, I wanted to be a guitarist and, you know, play music. But I found this magazine and I'm reading it and they had a page that was like the awards for different recording schools. I was like, you can go to school for that. Like, I, I never knew that or even thought about it. And my thinking was, that sounds awesome. I have no idea if I would actually work in that field, but all I want is a college degree. So most people get college degrees and stuff that are completely irrelevant to what they end up doing in life. So I was like, why don't I just go study music recording? And one of the schools was Middle Tennessee State University outside of Nashville. And my credits would transfer and they had a cool program. It was like a couple really nice studios. I was like, that'd be awesome to be a recording engineer. So And I'm from North Dakota, going to school in Minnesota, and literally have never been in the South in in my life. And so I sign up, I get accepted, and I I move to Nashville. And I get there thinking I'm going to you know, study recording engineering and realize that they had a whole music business path. So like you'd have a minor in mass communications and business administration or something, but it was generally a, the, the major was recording industry management. So once I started taking some of the classes, I realized I really liked the business side and I ended up not doing any of the engineering. However, I kind of wish I had done some of the engineering classes because I, a and R a lot of records, so I'm in the studio a fair amount. But you know, we had like class on publishing and artist management, and you know, just kind of like all the facets of the music business. There was there were actual classes for it, and so at that point, I was like, I just want a degree, and this is a cool way to get a degree and who knows, but I didn't really know what the music business was. I'm from North Dakota. You know? <laughs> I didn't grow up on any entertainment, you know? What was the inspiration for you to start Position Music? Well, I was working for, a- after college, I was working for a label. Uh, we helped start a label for Pioneer Electronics in the mid nineties. And we were distributed through Atlantic, but no marketing or promotion, just sales and distribution. And while, you know, we, we had money, you know, Pioneer gave us a chunk of money to start a label for them. And there's like some name value to Pioneer. People know that company. But realistically, we we're just a small startup record label. And it's like, how on earth do you compete in this world? Like, you know, how do you promote artists? And I... I eventually got the idea is like, how do you get in soundtracks? Like that seems like a good way to promote artists. And so while at Pioneer, I started asking that question and learned that there was such thing as a music supervisor. And so I, I, I tried to get to know some of the music supervisors and then probably, I don't know, six to nine months after even having this concept, Pioneer shut the label down. And it was literally the same day that Polygram and Universal merged and laid off 4,000 people. So 
we at Pioneer were up to like 14 people and I'm doing A&R and marketing for the label. And so it's like, huh, you know, it's not like I'm going to go get another job when 4,000 people were laid off and I'm in Nashville having gone to school there. And I don't really want to be in Nashville anymore. I want to move to LA, but I don't really know many people in LA and I'm definitely not moving to LA and getting an A&R job. So I literally just like, well, I didn't have a choice. I had to become independent something. And so I had the ideas like, rather than doing what I'm trying to do for Pioneer, like, why don't I gather a whole bunch of record labels and catalogs? And like, because Pioneer, we only had like six records. It was, you know, wasn't alive for very long. So I just started gathering catalogs and I was like, I'm going to move to LA and have a bunch of music that theoretically will cover any need a music supervisor has other than major label, big copyrights, because I can't really do deals to represent them. So, you know, position really just came out of necessity. I was very passionate about what I was doing at Pioneer. I wouldn't have left. We were on the verge of signing some really cool artists. And, um, but I was just kind of kicked out of the nest. And now 20 years later, I'm really thankful for that. But it was just the idea of like, how do you figure out how to promote artists? And the idea of putting songs in movies and television uh, seemed like, you know, productive and a really cool thing to do. And, and what's interesting about it, Tyler, is that it, you were doing it at a time when that was a fairly, it was a different business than it is today. And it was a lot uh, smaller um, that world than, than, than the world that you operate in has become. And, and I'm just curious, in listening to your story, you know, you mentioned that you didn't know too many people in L.A. You mentioned that, you know, you, 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 you only had like, you know, with Pioneer, they only had six records. So my question to you is, how did you find the talent, you know, the labels and the talent to run position music at, at, at first in terms of getting all this stuff to place into film and TV? How did you build those relationships? Well, I still knew labels. So like you just have friends in the industry. So uh, one of my early clients was Malico Records, you know, a label that had old soul music from the 70s. So like they had Ring My Bell and Mr. Big Stuff and they had an artist named King Floyd. They were out of Mississippi. So and they had a presence in Nashville. So somehow I knew them. I don't really remember how, but so I, I hit them up as like, hey, I'm moving to California. I'm going to start repping things for film and television placement. And, you know, everyone's response was like, no one had heard of this. It wasn't really a thing. And I definitely didn't know it to be a thing. So I think I'm just making it up. And so labels were generally like, sure, you know, I'm working on a commission basis. So if I bring them something, they pay me a commission. It's kind of win-win. And so it was, it was pretty easy to gather catalogs in the early days. And, you know, we had a you know, just a handful of labels I started with, but you, you rep one label, you might have a couple thousand masters in one, you know, deal. So like you can build a catalog pretty quickly by repping other people's catalogs. And so I just gather everything I can. And I was already an A&R guy. So I knew to sign artists. It was just kind of natural for me. And I'd worked for a little indie label before Pioneer. And, you know, it was just like, you, you go license a record for $1,000, you put it out and sell a couple thousand records and it keeps the light on. And so, you know, the idea of signing artists wasn't anything new. And so I, I kind of would rep labels and then I'd sign indie artists to, to rep deals. And really just with the idea of like, let me just fill as many genres as I can and theoretically have what, what a music supervisor would need. So I moved to California. I, I have some catalog and... You know, like Rich, you may know this, but you may not like overtly know this. Like you're part of my beginnings, you know, like music business registry, buying your music supervisor <laughs> catalog was, was like gold. You know, it's like, here's a bunch of people who I need to become clients, you know, so I would subscribe to your thing and get it. You know, I, I don't remember if you put it out annually back then or yes. quarterly, but uh, annually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I would get that and I would just get on the phone and start calling and you know, I had one other thing I use that no longer exists, but it's like your directory and music reports used to put out like weekly what music supervisors right. were looking for. So those two things were like leads. And I'm just calling music supervisors, introducing myself. And, you know, the amazing thing is I didn't totally know what I was doing. So I, I got an introduction to Alex Patsavis. And so I went and met with her 
And she's literally the first music supervisor I ever met. <laughs> oh my God, wow. <laughs> you hit the so, pinnacle you know, right out of the park for right. the first one. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, start at the top. So she sits down with me and she's like, okay, so if you're going to do this, because I'm still kind of presenting like I'm going to do this. She's like, if you're going to do this, you're going to need to do all the sync licensing. And I'm like, well, sure, of course, you know? And I literally <laughs> didn't know what a sync license was. I was just like... <laughs> But if I have to do it, I'll do it, you know? And so in, I started in May of 1999, you know, I only really know of one company who started this before me, uh, Ocean Park Music Group. And I didn't know of them. I didn't know this concept. I just literally thought I was making it up. And then there's a few people that came from publishers that ended up branching out and, and starting rep companies. But these were the early days and not a lot of people were like going after the music supervisors. And so... I found them fairly easily to access, easy to access, and I'm kind of learning on the job, and a lot of them were really kind. I have to give them credit, it's like making a few mistakes along the way, and they'd kind of you know help you walk through it. And I remember very early on licensing a song from one of my label clients for like $2,000 for, uh, who knows, video game or something. And we get all the way through the license process and they're committed to the track and everything and then find out that a Sony writer had 10% of the song. And like, I just wasn't experienced enough to know, to really vet even my own clients. Like, are you telling me you have hundred percent of this? Right. You know, it's like, mm. and do you actually? And so I learned the hard way that like we had to go like mass rush, clear 10% from Sony ATV which, you know, most people know that may not be an easy process, right. particularly when it's 2,000 all in. So we're talking 1,000 aside. We're talking 10% of 1,000. is They have to clear a $100 license. They're obviously in no hurry to do that. Right. <laughs> but the music supervisor, you know, helped because they have the relationship. Sony's more, you know, inclined to bend over backwards if a supervisor is really asking for a favor. So it's like, okay, I learned that lesson. Like really know what you're pitching. You know, if you're pitching it as one stop, make sure you actually have it as one stop. So, you know, we just like made it up as we went and well, me really. And like my very first license, so I started in May of 1999. My very first license was August of 99. And it was, there's a film called Hackers. And um, they were making a sequel, Hackers Takedown. <laughs> and, and we got uh, $500. And so that was my very first license. Like, all right, I'm in business. But when you think about it, I'm getting a small commission on $500. Like, I'm going to have to do this a lot. To oh, make right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, I mean, it's like, especially if, if that is what you thought the average license was. <laughs> yeah. You know, the funny thing, too, is I work so hard to get it. I'm following up with this guy so often. And then we get down to licensing, and he's like, hey, man, can we do this for 400 Oh, my and God. God. And I'm like, I was like oh, come on, man. I've got more charge for this. And it's like, do you really need that 400 And he's like, just say no. <laughs> and I was like, no, let's keep it at 500 He's like, okay. <laughs> Wow, so, that's great. So that was the beginnings. That's how position started. That's awesome. Okay. Tyler, a sync is a big aspect of position uh, music's business. Uh, has the proliferation of so many new music companies, libraries, and, and publishers driven the price you can ask for a sync down? Or has the enormous volume of shows that are out today have offset that? Good question. You know, I think we we didn't start out as a kind of high price company because I, I just didn't really know really. Mm -hmm. So some copyrights would get pretty normal fees and, and indie artists, you know, they would expect really low fees. And so when you're starting out and a TV show says, Hey, we have a thousand dollars. You, you're like, okay, I'm, I'll take a thousand dollars. So I don't know if I had any experience to really know how to price things. I remember our very first trailer that came in was for a Sony film, and I wasn't even sure how they got it. You know, we're servicing all this music, but I don't, I didn't know who the client was, so they're just calling, you know, to clear it. And I was kind of like, wasn't sure what to quote, and they just said, well, why, why don't we just do twenty thousand? And I'm like, okay, you know, <laughs> twenty thousand. <000. laughs> I would have done it for 2000 Like, I just had no idea how to price a trailer, you right. know? So it's like, wow, you can get $20,000. Yeah. You're like, 
<laughs> so, and then some supervisors, and honestly, I'll say a good chunk of them, really are just fair. And so in the early days, we'd, we'd be working on a TV show and they'd just tell you, this is what I have. And you build a relationship with them and you kind of learn, like, that's what they have. And so sometimes we'd get three, $5,000, who knows? And, you know, they'd kind of treat us normal to a lot of other things they were doing. Maybe not major label prices, but, you know, like decent indie sized label prices. So, you know, it's just really about doing as much as you can and not really sweating the price too much. And over time, you start to see patterns and you see when someone's really offering you something low or not. And so, you know, I, I talk about it being like the art of the quote. It's really a skill to know how to quote and, you know, to really maximize things, but also be reasonable and fair. And, you know, it isn't just about always getting the most dollar out of any one situation. It's really building a relationship and doing it over and over. Um, as far as the question of have prices come down, I mean, I, I think so. But I think we're also a company that maybe hasn't been subject to some of that because I think we're just signing bigger things. And so I think we've just are in a place where you get treated normal and it isn't like, Oh, you're a small indie label. We want to give you the lowest price or you're a music library. So we're expecting music library prices. So, you know, we've been doing this for 20 years. So we know what things should be priced at and some artists maybe should be priced lower and some artists should be, you know, typical major label pricing. And you just kind of have to navigate that. I think, you know, the, over the course of our company, um, I started out just repping labels and then having some indie artists. A few years into that, I learned that there was such thing as a music library. I didn't even know that concept. I come from the label world. And I was like, oh, maybe we should have some of that. And the idea being, we have some big copyrights, like Mr. Big Stuff or whatever. We have some indie labels that have artists that are decent size. And then we have indie artists that are just small indie artists. Maybe I should have the lowest tier music library. You know, So we started some production music. And that serves the needs of like the MTVs of the world. Like in the early days, we would be all over Pimp My Ride or Punked, you know, all these MTV shows, you know, they don't have composers. So they just score it with library music. And I didn't come from the library business, so I didn't really know what library music was. So I just thought library music was just instrumental versions of contemporary music. So all we did was hip hop and electronic music and rock and just made it to be used in backgrounds. I didn't really know underscore or like, you know, reality shows like using kind of dramatic tension music. We didn't do any of that. We just kind of made kind of cool instrumental music. And so that worked really well on MTV. We had a ton of it. And then, you know, what you're talking about is like the competition is now there's just so much production music in the world. I think the prices have fallen a lot in that world. Um, I think TV production companies now want a piece of that publishing. So they're either creating their own libraries or they're doing these crazy deals to like retitle all the music and then take half of the retitle. And it's just kind of gone nuts. And we've just kind of not gone down that road. So we have a production music library. We don't do gratis deals. We don't do retitle deals. And we just kind of walked away from a lot of that. So reality television, like if you want to license our music, great, we're happy to do it. But if you want some of these screwy deals, we just don't do it. And there's plenty of composers or libraries that will do it. So I, I've seen it there. And quite honestly, like where we're headed as a company, I'm not passionate about selling production music deals and beating my head against a wall trying to get some blanket with a tv production company that basically only wants a gratis deal so we are in the process of removing production music from our world we're going to put it under another brand and we're going to distribute it through another company so that position music really is just going to focus on what we're most passionate about. And those two things are artists. And we haven't talked about this yet, but like we're very good in the movie trailer business. And so we make trailer music. And we, we have a girl that runs our head of sync also runs the trailer department. Emily Weber, you know, is jokingly known as like the, you know, trailer music queen and she just lives and breathes that world she knows all the editors and creative directors and producers and we've just built a really great roster of of composers that are really geared towards trailer music and so we we really want to excel in that world but the traditional production music game while we'll still continue to make it and distribute it through other means i want to give the outlet to our writers and producers to continue to make it we don't want to be the company on the front line selling it we just want to focus on regular license deals you, you know you, you mentioned the, the the trailer business which which 
you know, position has a very, very good reputation for. And I, I want to ask you a, a business question because that is a very specific world. As you know, the intricacies of that, it's not the same relationships or budgets, by the way, that you deal with in placing music into film or TV. It's different people. It's after the fact. And it's a different um, personnel set. How did you go about historically developing the relationships with those people? I mean, you started out with some very big ones. You got Harry Potter trailers. You got Spider-Man trailers. How did you develop the relationships with those people over the years to build your trailer business? Yeah, you know, early on, I remember I had a list. And it may have come from your registry. I, I remember I had a list of the supervisors. And Craig Murray Productions was a trailer company back in the day. It doesn't exist anymore. And there's some supervisor listed at Craig Murray. And so I call up and I'm like kind of fishing. It's like, you're the music supervisor and what are you working on? And, you know, he, and I didn't know I was calling a trailer company. So, and he just kind of is like, yeah, I don't think we're the company for you. And like, cause I didn't know what I was talking about. And, and so <laughs> I was like, okay, <laughs> bye. And then we started getting like that first trailer request we got from Sony. And then we got a, a few others. And I was like, how is this happening? And then started learning that there was such thing as a trailer company and that they are hired by the studios to create these trailers. So then we started like realizing how it worked and being intentional about it. So, you know, I had the good fortune of day one of this company, I did two things. I started position music, uh, repping things for film TV licensing, and I managed one artist, an artist called Cell Dweller. And Cell Dweller is very like electronic rock, industrial roots, and kind of a one man machine, creates everything. And he naturally, because of industrial music, like, naturally did sound design but neither of us were conscious that that was a thing per se that translated to movies so when we made our first cell dweller record literally every song on the record we got licensed and several songs multiple 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 times and one of the areas was movie trailers so like cell dweller was that very first trailer i did various trailers came in and then we landed spider-man 2 and so i had an artist that just naturally worked really well for trailers and so that kind of opened the door and then we i just started meeting some of the trailer supervisors and kind of knew what questions to ask now and i remember very specifically holly hung at the time was uh, i forget she was at mm, mob scene i can't remember uh mojo which she was at and we had lunch and i brought a stack of cds back when you literally burn cds to give to music supervisors and we're having lunch and i haven't presented any of this music to her yet but one of them had orchestral something on the spine and we're talking and she just stops and her eyes get really big and she says does that say orchestral i was like yeah i brought this for you because i'm starting to realize that maybe orchestral music is going to work for trailers and she got so excited and it just like triggered it like that was the moment is like oh there's such thing as trailer music not just cell dweller my band that's like really cool and works for trailers you can be intentional about making music for trailers and that changed everything i realized okay i need to like hire composers and like get them to really think in those terms and so then i was fortunate my next door neighbor at a townhouse i was living in on the west side was a guy named james dooley and jim works had worked with hans zimmer for years was over at remote control you know had a studio there and most of the stuff like when they had leftover stuff from film scores they'd put it through extreme so jim had music through extreme and you know they were doing a good job for him and i was this tiny little company and i'm thinking i want to create some trailer music and so Jim and I had known each other for a while, but I never approached him for music because like he was doing way better with extreme than I think I could offer him. So he eventually, now that I want to do the trailer music, I know he's a film composer and does orchestral music. I was like, Hey Jim, would, would you do a favor for me? I'm doing this compilation. Would you just do like a couple of songs for this trailer music compilation? He's like, sure, I'll do it. He gives me three songs. We get a call for Spider-Man three looking for music. And I said, well, I have this, but it's not really done, but you can check it out. 
And I get a call back literally a week later and supervisor says, okay, we've cut in one of these songs. It's not doing everything we want. So we're still looking. I was like, well, wait, it's not done. Tell me what you want it to be and we'll help. And so we ended up doing 46 revisions. <laughs> wow. And uh, we land the Spider-Man 3 campaign. And funny enough, I... <laughs> they would license each revision separately. And I didn't really know that maybe it should all be rolled into one song. Wow. It's still the same song. So like they didn't license all 46, but literally it's like, okay, trailer, you know, the teaser trailer was version two and then they would have a TV spot that was version seven. And then the, we got the main trailer and it was versions 10 and 12. Like wow. they take all these different pieces. And so literally they're just licensing each, each one, one from me and wow. I, I don't know any better. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll just license <laughs> it again. So it ended up becoming a massive campaign for us. Right. And so Jim was thrilled. And then it was like that those three songs turned into a full album and we ended up doing very well for him. And he was kind of like ground zero for us being becoming trailer experts. And he, you know, he continued to write for us for years and we became good friends. And so that's how we kind of stumbled into the trailer business. That's wow. that's amazing. That is. Uh, let me ask you, uh, Tyler. Since you started the company, it's evolved into a full blown music company today, where you guys have five, div you know, five different divisions: synchronization and licensing, A and R, administration, label services, and artist management, making you guys fully equipped to handle the creative and professional needs of the modern day artist. Was that intentional on your guys' part or on your part, or did it just evolve organically as the industry evolved? evolved for you guys? Well, I think it's what I wanted from day one, you know, m managing cell dweller, like our goal was to make him a huge artist. And, um, so, you know, wanted to get him a record deal, wanted him touring on high levels. And we did end up getting a record deal, never really broke him as an artist in the traditional radio sense and all of that. But he's, you know, 20 years later, he's built a massive cult following and still makes records and does a lot of work in the film TV industry. So he's had a very successful career, but it wasn't how I envisioned. You know, I, I, I as manager wanted a big record deal and, you know, have have a hit radio song. So then it just became very sync focused for years and years and years. I ended up managing a guy named Tyrone Wells. I've only I had only managed two artists in the first 10 years of this company, Cell Dweller and Tyrone. And Tyrone was a really great live artist, still is. And we were building some heat around him and got him signed to Republic. So I was like, all right, I've finally got a major label record deal. And we're touring and doing everything. But at the end of the day, just never had the, the hit radio song. And so we did two albums with Republic, never broke them through. And But similar to Cell Dweller, it's like, He's gone on to have a very su successful career. He's one of our biggest songwriters still to this day and still tours and, you know, plays like troubadour level rooms and um, but never broke massive. But like, you know, has had a very good life. And I think looking back, he's probably thankful he never did have a massive hit. Like it probably would have sent his life in a different trajectory. And I think he's thankful of kind of how it all played out. But going in, you, you know, you think you just want to make superstars. Then it was very focused on just being a publishing company. You know, I came from the label business, but I exited the label business in 1999 as it started its decline. I entered the sync business in 99 as it really entered its, you know, incline. And I, I didn't necessarily have that foresight. It was just kind of like intuition maybe. So it was like all about sync and I didn't want to be a record label. I think there's so many things about being a label that are difficult. It's a tough business, but also relationally, the thing I don't like about it is there's kind of culturally, I think, a built-in adversarial component to record label artist relationships. And I tend to get along with people and I tend to get along really well with my artists. And I have been always hesitant to wave that label flag too much because as a label, you've never done enough. You didn't, you didn't get them on radio. You didn't get them on tour. You didn't give them enough money for tour support. You didn't get it high enough at radio. You didn't do expensive enough videos, whatever. You've kind of never done enough. And even at the highest of levels, there's more you can do. So we kind of wrestled with that for a long time, like not wanting to be a label. Eventually, it just kind of birthed out of being a publishing company because as a publisher, we just started making a lot of records. And I think in the earlier days, 
we were making records without the expectations of radio or massive touring. So when you have that understanding with the artist, like what the intention is, is like, hey, we're going to put out some cool indie records. And quite honestly, sync's going to drive most of it. And if you do a good job in that, then everyone's pretty happy. And some of those records may sell decently. And now today, you know, translates to a decent amount of streams. And it's great. It's kind of bonus in some ways. Of course, you do that for a while. And then you just always have higher ambitions. So eventually we get to like, all right, we're signing this artist as a record label with the intention of making them a really big band. So eventually we did get there. And, you know, the first artist that we really rallied around is a band called Welshly Arms. And they're just a cool rock band that was starting to do some touring. And we had a vision for what they could be and what it could be on a global scale. And so, and we we're doing some sync for them along the way. So we get them on a big, like 53 city tour, you know, opening their first of four, but playing the Greek, playing Red Rocks. And, you know, we're getting sync along the way. So, the, the concern about being a label and having to fund everything is like literally we have six band members on the road. We're having to provide tour support. You know, they're getting like, I don't know, 500 bucks a day or something. That's kind of hard to travel around the country doing that. And as we're doing that, though, we're getting sinks. We land like a $50,000 beer commercial. Like, all right, there's our tour support. Use sync to kind of leverage the development of an artist. Interesting. So we've done that. And then they started getting some heat in Europe. We signed them to Universal out of Germany. The record goes to radio. Um, As it's starting to rise at radio, all the U.S. labels start calling. It ends up being a top 10 single in Germany. And then we sign them to Republic here. And, you know, they're becoming a pretty large touring band. Um, You know, last year, 16 major festivals, like eight in Europe, eight in the U.S., Lollapalooza of the world, Reading and Leeds and, you know, Rock'em Ring, Rock'em Park. And then we get the 30 Seconds to Mars tour and like, it's just, it's all happening. And so we take the song here, it goes like top 15 at alt radio, top 30, hot AC, but still that's not like truly breaking a band. So that's, that was record one. And so now we're entering record two and it's just, you know, a never ending development process, but you know, they've had three top 10 singles in Germany now. So they're selling real tickets in Germany. We're playing, you know, 25 seat, 2,500 seat venues and these major festivals. So that's awesome. very exciting. Now we've done that, you know, a couple more times. We have a band called twin XL that is, I think they're trending like 25 on on the alt radio charts right now we helped build the band um and then upstreamed it to sony red and so sony is really going after radio and doing a good job and so we're still involved in the record and we're the publisher and you know so sometimes that's the strategy is like build a band and hand them off but be the publisher in in listening to a lot of these artist development stories i I, i'm curious from the perspective of your company which is over a 20-year period has the criteria changed or expanded over the years for you regarding the artists that you will sign given your current infrastructure today versus the past? Is there any difference today for you? Yeah, I mean, we have a A&R meeting every Friday and, you know, we have six A&R people plus coordinators and we bring in some of the sync team into that meeting. So there's probably... I don't know, 14 people in that meeting. And so it's kind of a tough room, you know, so the A&R people will play things that they're considering signing and you generally want the room to sign off. Sometimes it's like, yeah, we like it, but we wish the mix was different or we wish it was a better hook or whatever. So sometimes they'll get feedback and go continue to develop with the artist. Or if everyone digs it, then it's like, all right, go for it. Or, you know, but there's any number of things that are just passes you know it's just like no it doesn't fit the criteria but we do sign a fair amount of stuff so like we you know we have seven people on the sync team so we have a lot of clients and we constantly want to fit you know fill their needs so new music's an important part of what we're doing but you know as we look at it a couple different ways you know i get torn sometimes because sometimes you hear something that's like you know what that is good for what it is, you know, it's functional. We know that's going to serve this group of music supervisors that are on this show that need that type of music, but it isn't necessarily something we have a vision for, like going the distance, you know, it's not something that we're going to rally around to try to, 
you know, build a touring base or really go after digital marketing or eventually try to bump up to a major. It's like, you know what? It serves a purpose in the world. And often that artist may be quite happy with that. They're not trying to tour. Um, they're not thinking they're going to get on the radio. They just want to make music and make a living. So it works. And then there's a side of me. It's like, oh, I just want to be just utterly passionate about things and like feel like, okay, this is the thing we want to take the distance. And you can't just sign those because they're very hard to find and probably wouldn't fund a company if we only signed the things we were just massively passionate about. But I also don't want a company that we only sign a bunch of functional stuff because that's really no fun. Like we got in the music business because we like music and we want to be excited about what we're talking about. So I think it, you kind of have to cover that scale. Yeah. It, it, you know, it, it's interesting. I'm, I'm reminded of a, uh, of a conversation once with Monty Lippman of, of Republic where he said, you know, you have to, you know, when you're operating at a certain scale, you have to think, you know, is the exactly what you just said, Tyler, is this something that I want to go the full distance with? Because he said, you know, when I'm thinking that as a company head, he said, I'm thinking, you know, is this something that we're willing to put the three, four, five hundred thousand dollars into for promotion, for marketing, for extra publicity, you know, for all those things that you're saying. And he said, also, the reality is, even if you are a major, you only have so many chances up at bat that you can, you know, do that with. You you cannot do that for 40 or 50 artists, even if you're Sony or Universal, you know, an individual label. You You can't. So he said, you have to really give those kinds of considerations. So it's just interesting listening to you because even at a major label level, those same considerations that you just articulated are of concern as well. Yeah, it is interesting. You know, I think when Republic's signing something, they are mainly thinking, can it be a home run? I don't think they probably serve the, the, the other side of the scale I'm talking about where it's it, it serves a purpose. It's functional, you know? Right, right. Um, I think Monty and Avery are just so home run, you know, minded. And I respect them a lot for it. I think also something they wrestle with is I think sometimes they'll sign things because the market says sign it. And so sometimes data will drive some major label decisions. Like, you know, it isn't always just passion. I'm guessing, you know, it's like if, if the market's saying this record is completely taken off and, and you might listen to it and you're like, I don't know why, but it is. Sometimes they'll be like, all right, there's a fire there. We're going to sign it and pour a bunch of fuel on it and see if we can totally blow it up. And so I think that's the other side of the equation for them, where I have to think in terms of like, is it functional? They think, well, it's practical. The market's telling us, so we're going to go. And then there's other times where they go, this artist is a star. You know, I was there while they signed Amy Winehouse. You know, Tyrone was there as all that was happening. And I watched them, you know, bring her in and like blow that up. Right. And, you know, it's like the reality is she was a star and they saw it and they went after it hard and they, they made it work. It was, you know, it's incredible when that machine gets excited about something. Yeah. What they can do. It's yeah. fun to, to witness it, you know, and I've had two artists at Republic and, you know, you, they go in excited. <laughs> right. They'll only be excited for so long. So exactly. if, if they don't get that feedback, their excitement moves on. Yeah. Definitely. Um, but it certainly is fun to see their, their passion when uh, they feel like they have something going. Tyler, in, in your experience, are there specific non-creative qualities, traits, or characteristics uh, that you look for in artists and songwriters that you choose to work with? And, and has that criteria evolved over the years for you? Good question. I don't know. I think I tend to be very passion-driven. So like, I'm just kind of gut. Like, If I really feel it and like it and and I think we do ask this question often in our A&R meeting. Like sometimes someone will bring something really cool. And, and our question is, how are we going to bring value to them? And, you know, what is the outlet for this? Are we signing it purely as a record label? And like really Spotify is our goal? Well, you got to get a lot of streams to, to make any money. Right. Is it sync driven? And if it's sync, what is the outlet? Because... You know, you have film and television, you have advertising, you have movie trailers, you have video games. We try to sign things like if we're thinking, all right, we are bringing value as a company that does a lot of sync. We try to sign things that 
can hit multiple media. So the money is in advertising. You know, sometimes we'll get good film licenses and decent TV licenses, but you know, rarely is where it's at. Yeah. I mean, if you're talking six figure licenses, you know, you, you have to be in the ad space largely. And so, and movie trailers are just, it's just advertising. It's motion picture advertising. It's just a subset of advertising. Right. And TV promos, it's just advertising. You know, it's not in show. It's advertising. This show is going to play next week, you know? So those areas of advertising tends to be where the bigger budgets are. And Rich, you alluded to this earlier because it's it's not the same people. When you're talking, asking me about trailers, it's not the, the music supervisor in the film or television show. It's the marketing department. And all they care about is how do I get more people into the theater or how do I get more eyeballs to watch at 8 o'clock tomorrow night? And so all they care about is what piece of music is going to best sell my message. And, you know, we work hard to learn what music is most likely going to appeal to them that best sells their message. So we ask, like, if, if it's something cool, but the only place is going to be television or, or film. And film, it's very hard to make money in. It's either low budget or high budget. You know, it's like you yeah, don't no get a lot middle, of no middle class. class. Yeah. yeah, it's gone. You're right. So um, if it's primarily television and, you know, it might be fit the type of shows where, yeah, you're only getting $3,000 licenses or something. And are and is it the type of song that's like, going to be incredible for one scene next year and that scene's going to be worth three thousand dollars like maybe it doesn't make sense to sign that artist even though we really like it we just don't know what the outlet is for it and so are we going to add value to that artist sometimes you just go i don't care i just really like it and if i'm going to fail i want to fail with something really good or you just go we just don't see the upside like if if we can't sign an artist and think like there's a path to doing a hundred thousand dollars in sync, you know, is it the best value add to them? And is it the best use of our time? Hey, insiders, we hope that you've been enjoying our featured interview. Stay tuned because we've got so much more value coming your way. But before we dive back in a word from our sponsor, Hey Rich, you're the founder, CEO, legend of music business registry. Tell us what the music business registry is all about. Well, what it's about, Eric, is it's a company that is designed to provide the most accurate and up-to-date contact information for the music business. So if someone is looking to reach the A&R community, if someone is looking to reach music publishers, if someone needs to reach artist managers, if someone needs to reach music attorneys, if someone's looking to place their music into film and television and needs to reach all the music supervisors, that's the contact information that we provide. We've been doing it for 28 years. We're sort of the industry standard, if you will, uh, for the music business uh, and, and have been serving them since 1992. So that's what we do. Amazing. So if I wanted to find out, let's say uh, A&R uh, people from uh, Warner Brothers, let's say, I can just go in there and find that in the A&R registry? Absolutely. You'll find all of the Warner Brothers in there. You'll find the Warner Brothers in LA, Warner Brothers in New York, Warner Brothers in Nashville, Warner Brothers in London, Warner Brothers, you know, probably in Australia as well. So those are the, the main territories that we cover. Amazing. And we're offering all of our insiders right now that are listening, if you visit musicregistry.com, and use coupon code MUBUTV10 at checkout, you'll get a 10% discount off your first order. That's musicregistry.com, coupon code MUBUTV10. Anything else you want to say, Rich? Well, when you're ready to put your music to work, musicregistry.com. Interesting. You know, Tyler, today the rules of breaking independent artists, as, as we've been discussing, they've really evolved in the streaming age. And I'm curious, how has the role of streaming been helpful to you in breaking artists at position music? Well, it's interesting. You know, streaming's so fascinating right now. I'm so thankful that we're in this era. Like, we've eliminated the need for a distributor, although we do use distributors. Um, they do bring value in, in some ways. But, like, anyone can now distribute their music. We're no longer talking about physical retail. We're no longer talking about, you know, paying for placement in the store. Um, you know, the, the, the playing field has been leveled in a lot of ways, although the majors do have relationships with the DSPs 
in ways that are stronger than others. But the cool thing is like if a song's really connecting, it can connect. And it can end up streaming a lot, really with no effort of ours. And so we have songs and artists that could be, you know, 20, 30, 40 million streams on Spotify, and they've never played a show. It's like Sync has driven it. Um, or we do covers, you know, we'll do covers for movie trailers or whatever. And some of these covers just take off because the audience likes it and they save it in their playlist and they play it and it just kind of lives on for a long time. It's, it's when you sign an artist and you're trying to be really intentional about getting them a bunch of streams. It is so hard. Like you, you, it's almost like you have way more success with the things you're not even trying. Right. When you're really trying, it's, it's a long process. So someone said this to me the other day, and this really resonated with me, you know, like in pursuing playlists and like how to work the streaming world is, you know, we were asking the question, like, does it make sense to hire, you know, those companies that do playlisting and, you know, some of these playlists will go pitch and they'll come back and be like, they're essentially paid for play playlists exactly it's like all right you can yeah we'll add you to our playlist it's uh 150 dollars or whatever and we've literally never done it i have hired a couple companies early on that were that would do playlisting and i don't know maybe the first one seven years ago maybe we saw some benefits and then we hired one a couple years ago and it was like nothing and so our current distributor is just like it's a waste of time don't do it and other people's like it's a waste of time don't do it so we were having this conversation just the other day with some other people and really the point was hammered home to me is like you want to know how you get on playlists and how you really build a streaming audience you go market that artist off platform you go find the fans not on spotify and apple you go find them on instagram and facebook and email lists and touring like you it's like old-fashioned marketing yeah you do that and then it ends up translating and so you know, we want this quick fix. Like we, we want to yell at our distributor and say, get us on playlists. That's your job. You know, like that's our marketing plan. And really, if you want to break indie artists and build artists, like go do the hard work, like go build it the old fashioned way. And then it, it, it comes. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. I've, I've talked to a lot of managers who have gotten on these playlists, big ones, and they say pretty much that's all they did. They got on there. But it said it did them no benefit. You know, they were on a playlist that, you know, people listen to, but it didn't seem to help. I I don't know if they had. And, you know, of course, not knowing the particulars, I didn't know the songs that they were getting on. I all I knew is that they got on these things, but it didn't help. And listening to you talk about this, it's like, yeah, you're talking about going and identifying the audience for this music and searching them out off platform. That's the way to do it, to build, you know, go where that market is uh, in any way, shape and form. Not just hoping that, you know, oh, if I get on the, the streaming thing or if I get on this playlist, suddenly that's it. I will just have my career made and it will just take off from there. If that were the reality, you know, no one would need a label. Yeah. And I think it's, what is the goal? You know, there's some things where our goal is just make some money. It's like get on Spotify, stream as much as we can. We're not worried about whether those streams translate to anything else other than maybe sync. It's nice when you get discovered on Spotify and end up getting a sync from it, but you're not trying to tour. You're not really trying to build a, a career, but if you're really talking about building a band, then you have to do the hard work. And it is funny, like how hard it is, how hard it is to get to 1 million streams on a song on Spotify when you really care about it. (laughs) And then we have songs that are like 26 million and we literally didn't do anything, you know, it just like naturally worked and maybe sync drove some of it and maybe, but you just, you, you get in that algorithmic river and it just floats you along. And I don't know, it's a fascinating world. And we're we're kind of in this transition still where we've we've taken a few artists, you know, worked hard to build and been intentional and we've been able to bump those artists up to major labels. Whether that's a good goal or not, I don't know, but it's what we've done. Like when you're talking radio, we're not wanting to do radio under this roof at this stage in our life. So we want a major label partner. That's what they're built for. We have another artist, a girl named Timar, which really is the first artist I think we've signed label forward. 
you know, we, we played her in uh, an A&R meeting and quite honestly, her lyrics are, <laughs> let's just say not so sync friendly. And we're like, okay, what are we going to do with this? And we kind of moved on. And, and I was like, probably 20 minutes later, some other people had been playing songs. I was like, wait a minute, go back to that song. I want to hear it again. And it was just like, this song is so good, but we're probably not going to add a lot of value in sync. So I don't know. I just, I don't know. And then I went out to Palm Springs like a couple weeks later and I put the song on. It was like 11 o'clock at night. I love driving at night and just listening to music. And it just struck me. It was like, I, I literally listened to that song like 10 or 12 times in a row. And I was like, you know what? We're going to go for it. it. It isn't about sync. I really think this artist has the legs to go the distance and her voice is incredible and I think she's authentic and I think she has a unique place in, in the marketplace. And so we signed her to a record deal and a publishing deal, but like we're going to do everything we can to break this artist. And so we've released two singles and like her first single is literally about to hit a million streams on Spotify, but it's been so hard. And her video is, you know, over a million now on YouTube, but but she's the real deal. And like we've had so many calls on this, like so many people sniffing around, so many labels interested. And assuming it doesn't fall apart, like by the time this podcast is live, she'll be signed to a major label. So she's in long form negotiations right now and with a company that really sees the vision. And we're gonna bump her up and you know, let them do the next level of hard work. But like our role in this was like to do the real hard work from the very beginning. Cause it's really hard to get from a thousand Instagram followers to 10,000. And, and it's very hard to get from literally zero YouTube subscribers. Right. To, I don't know. We were at 30,000. I don't know. We may be at 40,000 now, but it's like, well, but then that's, where a major comes in, like once you've kind of done the early work, they can pour a lot more fuel on it and then really amplify it. So, you know, so we're in this transition of doing this, but we don't do that all day long. You know, there's not a lot of artists we sign where it's like, all right, we're, we're all in. Right. But I think over the next couple of years, we're going to be doing that more and more. And, and let me ask you with that, once the, re once the uh, relationship with the artist transfers into the major label system, are you guys still involved with that? Or is that pretty much handed off to them and you guys are hands off? Or are you still involved in that artist's career? Just be curious. Well, we're in all cases still involved with the artist because we're always the publisher. Gotcha. Um, our relationship to the label is probably different in every scenario. Mm -hmm. Um, with Welshly arms, it's unique because we're also their manager. So we're heavily involved with the label with twin XL. They have a manager driving that, you know, we'll work with the label on sync stuff. Our digital marketing team helps them as well. So like they have a whole team, but like we still supplement some of their marketing cause we're still deeply invested in that record. Right. Um, so I guess each with, each scenario is different. Each uh, situation is yeah, unique. Yeah, with with Tmar, I think it's going to be that relationship will be much more like step aside, son. I got this. Right. So I think they'll largely drive that, and um, you know we'll help where we can. But really, like we'll primarily focus on being the publisher, and you know we'll be pitching for Sync. Yeah, I mean, but it's really exciting to hear this because you're kind of uniquely positioned in so many different ways that you're kind of, uh, it, it's kind of like an interesting thing. It's almost like, I don't even know what I was thinking of, but it's just you guys are very uniquely positioned and it must be exciting for you because you're so passionate that you can stay involved with these acts beyond, you know, when they get leave you guys and are on, you, there's still a part of that that's still you guys. So I, yeah. Well, I think the next phase of, of the company that's really becoming right now is, you know, we've really made the conversion to be a full service publishing company. So, you know, we've been such a sync driven publishing company for years that we've now built a large team. You know, we have 27 people and we have a full admin team. We have a full sync team. We have a sync team bigger than, than various majors and, and we have a big A&R staff. 
So rather than just signing writers and artists, it's all about sync. Now it's about collaborations and getting them in sessions and, and writing with other people and like, how do can we really start, you know, getting major label cuts? And, and in my early days, I, I focused so much on being one stop in order to, to make the sync pitch easier. Right Now it's like, we're not so worried about that. You know, it's like, cause some of the deals we're doing, if you're licensing a song for whatever, a hundred grand for an ad, they're not really sweating whether it's one stop or not. If they have to go clear half of it from Cobalt, fine. You know, they, it doesn't matter. Right. So we're not so precious about being the only person on it. And, and in some ways we could start getting the benefit. Like, Hey, if we have a, co-write with a cobalt writer cobalt has a good sync team they may land something and now right you guys are involved in that yeah we get to ride along you know and and sometimes having multiple parties help the negotiation as well so sometimes the bigger labels or bigger publishers help get bigger fees and like we as the smaller publisher in you know in the deal kind of get the benefit of them saying no it really should be 120 not 100 right most favored nations everybody benefits (laughs) exactly (laughs) so and you know we're just trying to build more and more of a writer community and you know a a very physical manifestation of that at our offices is last year we, we acquired the building next to us and have built out a very nice recording studio. And so it started out just, oh, we just need a writing room. And then it's like, oh, we need a room to cut vocals. And then, no, we should be able to do proper mixes. And so we ended up just hiring full-blown studio designer and like spent nine months constructing a, a real studio. And really, we don't charge it back to our writers or artists. It's It's a marketing cost for us. It's, you know, we want to provide that for our writers. And we we welcome them bringing in outside writers and those outside writers come in and like, wow, what, what is position doing here? I didn't realize this. And then they spread the word and like really the best marketing we can do is happy writers. And it just leads to, to other writers coming in and artists or producers. And so we are in the process of signing writers to more traditional deals. Like historically we'd always just kind of do one-offs like, all right, we'll sign you to a five song EP and that's your only obligation. And if it doesn't work, then move on. And if it does work, we'll do another five song EP. So now it's like, okay, we're signing writers and really getting behind them and more traditional term deals. And and it's like, you then think, how are we going to maximize this writer's time and opportunity? And so sometimes it's like, depending on their goals, they, they want pop cuts. And then uh, that's, you know, a narrow margin game yeah, and, and hard to get, right? <laughs> yeah. And even when you get them may not be worth anything. So if you're just an album cut, not a single, it's like, you're so excited. Hey, we got a cut on whatever Atlantic records. And it's like, Oh wow, that was worth $3,000 in mechanicals. Yeah. If that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we can do that and sync easily. So, but you're you're shooting for the big ones. And so while that writer is spending, let's just say, 70% of their time pursuing getting in writing sessions for the big pop cuts, we then come along and go, okay, let's be strategic about your other 30%. Let's put you with some of our artists that might be more sync-oriented and start getting you cuts on records that Position is releasing. And we might ramp up some sync opportunities for them. And it just, you know supplements their their income as we're shooting for the big ones and like each writer you just look at strategically is like how should we split up your time and who should we put you with and what opportunities are are there in the world so we're thinking so much more that way now and you know 20 years we've built a company on zero hits essentially like we have one hit we have a platinum record in germany and switzerland with that welshly arms but that's not a global hit. And so we're really focusing on how, you know, how now to use the foundation we've built to leverage that into some real hits. Absolutely. Let me ask you, Tyler, is breaking an artist today a worldwide effort? And if so, does this pose a challenge in the marketing process for you as a company? Well, you know, it's funny because Wellesley was so internationally started and driven and we weren't very intentional about it. We just 
had a song go viral on the Germany Spotify charts. And so then the German labels found it and reached out to us. And then we just figured out who is the kind of the best partner. And then quite honestly, I just got to give them all the credit because they just heard the song, the song called Legendary. And they're like, we think this could be really big in Germany. And we didn't have the data to support it. It wasn't already on the radio. They weren't touring there. We weren't selling tons of records. They just heard it and said, I think that this can be big. And they went to radio. And so you kind of have the benefit of different in Germany. You know, it's like, Republic isn't going to do that here. They're not going to hear a song with no data right. and go straight to radio. They're going to want it to build. But, you know, Vertigo Capital is the label under Universal in Germany. They heard it and went and it went top 10. I mean, it did more than they even expected. They, I mean, they said if we could get a top 20 single, that would be incredible. Wow. It went top 10. Well, they knew their market. So they obviously saw something that obviously you guys wouldn't see being here and, and just ran with it. Yeah. And it was good timing because... Reg and Bone Man's Human was number one in Germany at that point right. and was really breaking. And Welshly is like in that ballpark, mm -hmm. you know, kind of rootsy, some bluesy kind of influenced rock with, you know, kind of some modern takes. And so they fit really what was happening at the time. So sometimes you just get good timing. It's, in, you know, what's interesting about that, Tyler, is that, you know, you're speaking about that rag and bone. And that was something that came to the major label. That was an enormous hit in England, a massive hit in Europe. It came to America. And um, I believe it was Columbia. Major, it was a top priority for Columbia. And they just couldn't even get it out the gate. It was like, I don't know if it was a cultural issue or what it was, but I mean, that record produced such strong reactions. I mean, I remember people like Elton John and so forth getting on social media, you know, screaming, like, what is wrong? Why can't this record happen in America? And, you know, you're talking about some very distinct things with regards to like, you know, uh, with Welshly Arms and so forth. M Mike, Mike question that I'm thinking as you and Eric were discussing this is, do you see that there's a different criteria for Europe and different opportunities for your artists in your experience over the years in other territories besides the US that we don't have here that you may have in like Germany or in England or in other territories? Well, I don't think I have a tremendous amount of experience in that because I don't think we've been intentional about marketing artists in Europe. I think we you know, got a label interested and ran with it. But the thing we do is sync. So we get a lot of international sync activity. And some of that comes from them discovering it maybe in other syncs. You know, it's like in a trailer. Yeah. And then they go, oh, we love that song. And then all of a sudden we get a request for a beer campaign in some country. And it's like, how did we get that? We don't know. Um, but it was the original sync that led to the next sync. Or you know, we have relationships and sub-publishers and we have people around the world that are pitching the music. So sometimes we go create something out of nothing in a territory. And then can that sync drive some marketing opportunities? That's the question. But we're just not a big enough marketing team where we're thinking in terms of like, all right, we're going to release this record in Italy and we know what digital marketing we need to do there. You know, we just, I, I don't really know. From what I've experienced, like as we've had different labels reach out to us for various artists, like we had another artist that licensed the record specifically for Italy and then they ended up spreading it to Europe, but they seem to be pretty traditional. It's like these labels hit us up and like radio is still very much part of the conversation and just there, you know, this particular company in Italy, like, you know, he was a radio promotion guy as well and had a label. So like he kind of had radio built in as an indie and like he could actually affect it, you know, whether, you know, getting some radio in Italy, like is how you break an artist. I don't know. We didn't, I think we had a top 10 single, but it didn't really move the needle that much. So I don't know. We're just so sync driven. It's like, all right, let's go maximize sync in foreign countries and you know, if we really have an artist starting to get some activity, we would probably license it to a label and let them drive the marketing. You know, trailer music, I want to go back to trailer music for, for a little bit, because trailer music is something that you have a very strong presence in uh, position music. But more importantly, you know, you're now making albums, uh, I mean, full on albums in, in trailer music. And I'm curious, how has this area of your company evolved over the years? Or is that how it's evolved where it's not just, you know, putting music into trailers, but you're actually creating this whole sort of, you know, musical genre where you're making 
full on recordings. I mean, that, that's also something that's that, that you're doing as well, which is something that's very distinct that that whole market sort of didn't exist when you started the business. Well, yeah, what's interesting, though, is that's all we've ever done. I didn't know any different. Like I, we definitely were n- never in the custom game early on. So when I started realizing there's such thing as trailer music and being intentional about it, I only knew to go make albums. So, you know, that James Dooley, those first three songs were going to be part of a compilation album, but it ended up turning into a James Dooley album. And, you know, we did it differently where most trailer music libraries brand themselves as let's just say the artists. So uh, immediate music or two steps from hell, like they're essentially companies, but when they release albums, it's just released as immediate music or two steps from hell or audio machine, whatever we brand the composer as the artist. So that's a James Dooley album on position music. Like we're a record label for trailer music and there's good and bad of that. You know, the, I think, the good is the composers, the artists really appreciate that. Like they like being branded and, you know, they get treated like an artist. And the bad is now we have to promote a bunch of brands. We have to promote James Dooley. We have to promote Tom Player. We have to promote Joe Blankenberg, whereas immediate music only has to promote one brand. And so all things kind of lead back to the core. So I'm kind of envious of that because I think they get a lot of the benefit of like promoting one brand and one thing leads to another. It's more work for me to get a, an editor to realize Joe Blankenberg is connected to James Dooley because they're on the same label when they only kind of see the front facing brand as the artist. So I think our artists appreciate it, but maybe there's benefit of of lumping it all under one thing. But yeah, so we've made albums from day one. And so the early days of even distribution is like, you you know, we're pitching them to all the trailer companies for sync and we get them used in television shows and like America's Got Talent, the big, you know, performance reality shows love our trailer music, you know, big dramatic moments. And so from the earliest days, we even released them commercially. So, you know, that first James Dooley album was available through CD Baby, you know, one of the few outlets back in the day of how do you distribute a record. And I mean, that's like, I don't know, 2004, 2005, something like that. So yeah, we started, you know, not only making them for sync, but then also releasing them commercially. And It is an important part of our business. And, you know, something that's happened recently, we've become official Apple Music curators. So we have, right now, I think we've launched 10 playlists that are all trailer driven. And we're encouraging the trailer music community, our competitors, you know, many of them are our friends as well. But it's like, hey, let's work together and build, you know, trailer music, which is sometimes known as like epic music. Let's build it as a genre. Let's let's make it more of a thing because it has a fair amount of followers. Yes, it does. Absolutely. Yes. When you look at some of these records on Spotify, you know, Two Steps from Hell would be, I don't know, 20, 30 million streams on some of these songs. And, you know, there's, you know, a dozen or so trailer, you know, labels like ourselves that release our music commercially. And, you know, there's an outlet for it. Let's build it more. Let's work together and build it. And the more we build it as a genre, the more it can spread to more people. You know, let's let's piggyback on film scores and, you know, people like to listen to film scores and composers. Like, let's just kind of merge with that and, you know, make it all known as, you know, this film and epic music. And hopefully not only does it spread to the overt listeners who are interested, but like, let's start leaking into playlists. So why shouldn't some of this dramatic trailer music be in workout videos, you know, m- kind of right. inspirational videos? Right. I mean, not videos, I mean playlists. Sure. Yeah. And it's like, then it's like, wow, what is this? This song's really cool. Because, I mean, some of this trailer music is very impressive composition. Oh, yeah, yeah, very much so. So we're trying to spread the word among, amongst the community. It's like, let's work together. So literally, like, you know, audio machine, you know, friends of ours. It's like, tell us when you land a big trailer, tell us and we'll put that song in a playlist. So, you know, we update some of the playlists every week with, you know, when new trailers come out every week, we update it. Some of the playlists aren't just trailer music. So it's like, hey, if, you know, Kanye is in the newest whatever trailer, it's like one of our playlists is just new music in trailers, regardless what it is. Right. Some are very trailer music oriented. You know, there's kind of like a history of trailer music where it's like the 
you know, the, the big songs over the years, you know, to educate people, some of the history of trailer music, some of it's just current, some of it's like what music's being used in video game trailers. And so we're trying to, you know, really increase those playlists and hopefully that helps spread the word and then try to do the same in, in Spotify. You know, another new development for position is user music. And I was wondering if you can tell us about that. Yeah. User music is a YouTube subscription platform. So for two reasons, you know, I started get involved in YouTube MCNs, multi-channel networks, I don't know, four or five years ago. We did a deal with uh, an MCM called Freedom. And at the time, they were the largest, largest MCN on YouTube in regards to channel count. They, I mean, they had over 300,000 channels. It was nuts. And Uh, That's changed a lot. YouTube's cracked down on a lot of things, you know, and you have to, you know, there's what's called the The partner program where you have to have like 4,000 hours and yeah, thousand minutes. 4K, 1K. Yeah. Uh, You have to have a thousand subscribers and 4,000 minutes, hours. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. To be qualified for that. Yeah. So that, that reduced, you know, the MCNs, you know, they had to get rid of a lot of channels when not everyone was meeting that requirement. But so in the early days, we, we, we essentially partnered with them and created an, an overall blanket deal that we allowed a good chunk of our catalog in position music to be used on all of their videos. So all 300,000 channels could access our site and download music and put it in their videos. And it was a very large deal for us. It was very exciting. It was probably the single biggest deal we'd ever done. And it was like, you know, it's kind of the early days, like, wow, it's YouTube. Like this is, you know, the wild West and it's so interesting. And like, what kind of business could really be generated here? And so that deal evolved over the years. And, and then we also just get so many YouTubers hit us and hitting us wanting to use our music. And so we created a micro license where they could license one, you know, a song for one video for 19.99. And so that all led to like, maybe we should create a subscription service. And so we launched usermusic.com. And now the we serviced the Freedom Network through that subscription service. It's no longer through Position Music. And that, that way we can allocate like these specific songs are available under that subscription. And we have the technology, like the subscriber can subscribe, link their channel. And uh, as they use our music in their videos, we release the claims and they can monetize their videos. It's not for any commercial purposes. So a brand can't subscribe and make brand branded videos. But for user-generated content, um, they can be a subscriber and go to town. And the idea is, like, can we serve YouTubers in bulk, you know? And and can that be something where it could really become a scalable business? Quite honestly, it's still early days, so who knows? But it It's a great idea. Great, great. Thank you. Yeah. It definitely makes life easier rather than constantly having to feed all these questions you know, it's like, all right, here, just go to user music, go, you know, sign up and do your thing. Exactly. No, that's amazing. Um, let me ask you, Tyler, for our listeners, are there any books, DVDs that you can recommend for our artists and anybody listening? Things that influence you or things that you think people should be? You know, I listen to Tim Ferriss's podcast enough to know I should have, uh, you know, this uh, answer ready. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good podcast. I love question. Tim. Tim is awesome. <laughs> well, back in the day, uh, I read a book called Good to Great. Oh, and great I book. think that had a lot of influence on me. Like I still preach some components of that book today. And it's, I don't know, it's probably been over a decade. We do, I'll sidetrack for a quick minute here. At the top of every year, we do a, uh, an annual retreat and we go off site, bring the whole staff. We talk about the previous year, how it went. Uh, and why, and we and we talk about vision for the upcoming year and what we're planning. And literally, you know, top of this year, that one of the key points of of good to great is a concept called the hedgehog concept. And it, you know, they can read it and kind of get the details of it. But essentially, it's like, what is the focus of your your company? And ask three questions. You know, what are you passionate about? What drives your economic engine and what can you be the best in the world at? Where those three circles intersect, that's where your focus should be. So I, you know, 
reinforced that concept at the top of this year. I used the exact same com- concept 10 years ago at a different company retreat, but it's still so applicable. And like, I think we as a company are really learning wh- what our focus is. And that's why we're eliminating production music from our front facing brand. And we're focusing on becoming a full service publisher. And really it's like, I use that principle to hammer that home. I think that book was really important to me. Um, and quite honestly, I, I haven't read a lot of business books lately. I go through cycles. And um, so I, I guess I just focus on that one. How can people reach you or your team at Position Music? What's the best way for them to do that? I mean, we just have a general contact. You know, I think it's contact at Position Music. Depends on what they want. Um, if there are artists submitting, we have um, submissions at positionmusic.com. And then, I mean, some of our emails are on the website. So the sync team you can reach or the A&R team you can re- reach through submissions. As, as someone who has successfully built a contemporary music company, what advice do you have for someone who wants to build their own music company today? You know, it's interesting you've, that that idea of like, oh, I wish I knew then what I know now. <laughs> right. Yeah. Don't we all? Well, the funny thing is... <laughs> I'm I'm actually thankful I didn't. Okay. Yeah. As much as there's so many things that would have been good to know, I think it would have felt too daunting to do it. Hmm. Right. Like, right. Yeah. If I really knew what it took to build this company, then I don't know if I would have felt like I could have done it. Right. And like the idea of my first license was five hundred dollars. Right. Yeah. And I'm just thrilled to get a five hundred dollar license. I'm naive that I'm going to figure out how to make this work. <laughs> I don't know what it means. I don't even have massive aspirations. Like, I don't know how big of a company I want to build day one, but you know, it's more like I'm managing this band. I think I can get them big record deal. I could, you know, that felt like, Oh, there's a path to making money and I'm kind of doing both these things simultaneously. So to some degree, I'm thankful that I was naive about a lot of things. I think passion has to drive it. Like the hard part for me now is like, we are successful enough as a company where the idea of starting from scratch sounds horrible to me because we now have leverage. Like we have 15,000 copyrights. You know, we have tons of clients that use us on a regular basis. You know, we have the financial means to sign writers, you know, every week. And like, it, it just wouldn't be fun, like having to go make all those calls and say, Hey, what are you working on? And, uh, you know, only have a handful of artists. Like back in my pioneer days, we only had five, six artists. It's kind of hard to land things when you have so few things. You need a catalog to, in order to serve clients well. And to get clients to care, you have to serve them well. So, you know, I just did it because I had no other option back then. Although there's something appealing about like, oh, it would be fun to just like focus on five artists that you're just massively passionate about. If you didn't have to worry about making from <laughs> building a business from scratch and making a living. I'm also very thankful I was single because I could take lots, lots of risks. And so if you're married or have kids, it's very hard to like launch a business from scratch. It takes quite a while for that to really generate any revenue. But back to your question, I think passion has to drive it because like you have to be excited about the little wins, you know, like if I were to start over from scratch now, like would I be as excited about that $500 license? Like that almost seems like to do the, and and I wouldn't have a staff, you know, so I'd have to do the license myself. (laughs) Right. And so I have to do this work for, you know, so little and like, it's so hard to get that $500 license. You know, it's one thing if they're coming in every hour. Right. So find things you're passionate about and like really celebrate the wins. And I think even like, if you think in terms of artist management, you know, it's good to start with an artist early when you're young. You don't have to be this big experience manager. It's like, because you get a lot more excited about these little wins than a big manager would. It's like, oh, whatever. Like I've done that a million times or that doesn't really move the needle. Well, sometimes not knowing that it doesn't move the needle is a good thing because you're excited about it. And maybe it leads to something else that moves the needle. Whereas that the big manager wouldn't bother to do the first thing that led to the second thing. Exactly. Right, because they're at a different station of life. Yeah. Tyler, I want to thank you so much for doing this. I really, really appreciate it. Hey, my pleasure. You know, Rich, we've known each other for a long time. Yes. I appreciate you hanging there for so long and like providing this service to so many clients. And like, I literally can attest how important you were 
in the beginnings of this company and for years, you know? And so thank you for your work. And um, I'm happy to do this. Thank you again. I, I really appreciate that very, very much. I do. Thanks. All right. We'll talk soon. That was a great one. That yeah. was a really great one. Amazing. And I enjoyed it. And here's why I enjoyed it, Eric. I thought, and I feel very strongly about this, Tyler Bacon, to me, represents a very, very contemporary company. This is something that I've seen in my own career evolve over the years. Right. The, the separation of record company, music publisher, sync, sync. licensing, yep. artist development, all of those, you know, management, well, they don't do management, but uh, maybe in some cases they do manage songwriters and producers. But it's that blending that is very, very, you know, a lot of companies do that today where those distinctions have been They have blurred. a full vertical where they could take the band and place them like a Disney. Exactly. You know? exactly. And that was not common. Right. That wasn't possible before. First of all, people didn't have that level of expertise. Second of all, they didn't have the money. Right. Third, you know, they didn't have the... It, just culturally within the business, they didn't have the willingness of artists to say, oh, yes, you can be my publisher and my, you know, and all of those things. His company, uh, Position Music, represents the what I call the new model right. of, of record uh, company. And he's very, very successful at it. And what a hardworking story. And, you know, you've known oh, yeah. Tyler since the beginning when he was I've a one-man operation. Since so, the 90s when, when yeah. he first started out. You know, he moved from Tennessee to California. And he literally built this company from the ground, from up, the yeah. ground up. You know, first himself and then, you know, uh, another And a really person. great guy, very humble. And it's really nice to see somebody taking something like that and building it and a good person behind Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And building it step by step yeah. logically, you know, first go and, and, and deep diving into those areas, right. learning all about sync, learning what that world was about. And then, you know, as technology and the culture within the business progressed, you know, getting into artists, getting right. into making records, you know, um, the, the guy, I'm blanking on his name right now, the, the chairman, of, um, Hartwig Mausch, one, yeah. who's the chairman of BMG, BMG yeah. once said that, you know, making records and bringing them to market is not, you know, the difficult part today. Right. It's bringing attention to the what attention. you're exactly. marketing. That's the difficult part. Right. And he says the reason is, is because recordings don't cost you know, like the, the cost of a house. Right. That's not the difficult part. And so what Tyler has done, and he's done it in an interesting way, and he talked about that when he talked about, you know, that criteria of signing that, you know, you look, f he and, and because of the thing that we talked about with wanting so many different, um, being in so many different areas, you look for something that can maybe work in sync and where in sync can it work? Or is this a passion project that you right. really want to break, that you really want to get on streaming services, that you really want to take, take to radio eventually and, and, and even farm it out to a major, which he's done in a couple of cases. Absolutely. Where Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, looking at all of those things, you know, I thought one of the more interesting things he talked about in relation to what you just said about you know, farming it out and, and signing it is when he spoke about that aspect of from an A&R standpoint, what can we, how can bring we bring to value. value to this? Yep. That's something that, you know, I think a lot of people need to Where he ask. talks about, I guess, the passionate versus the functional. Like, you know, how did they want to operate? And, you know, uh, also talking about, you know, what is... You know, how are we going to serve the artist in the, in their world? How are we going to serve that artist? I thought that was a great point. As Absolutely, well too. is a great point because not all artists are the same, and exactly. not all artists need the same thing, and not all artists want the same thing. R right, exactly. You know, and 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 he got into that later, I guess. You know, with like Welshly Arms and you know different situations. He's not going to treat that in the same way that you know he may treat another situation at his company uh, that maybe didn't have that particular circumstance. Um, going for them. So, yeah. And I think that leads us to the next uh, point that I thought we thought was really great was the non-creative qualities that he looks for. And, uh, you know, again, getting back to what we were talking about early, how are we going to bring that value to them? Uh, is this a passion driven, you know, he, he kind of talked about 
uh, and, and which is an ongoing theme, it seems like with A&R people and people that are in the in the creative areas, but that it's passion driven and gut instinct that a lot of times he's just going based on his gut, which is the, 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 the story that we keep seeing with everybody, whether it's Pete Gambarg or whatever other A&R, there's some part of that. There's a gut driven thing that they feel and they sense that that has something extra special where uh, they want to take it to the next level. Absolutely. And and can they do that? Right. And more and more companies today can. This is where, you know, managers, this is where companies like Position Music, this, you know, that are tied in to those worlds. You, you, you know, it's it's one thing to want to do it, like you're saying. It's quite another to be able to have the skill sets to be able to take your project into the world of sync, into the world exactly. of advertising, into the world of streaming services and so forth. And, you know, and looking and the other thing that I thought that he said was very interesting along those same lines, Eric, was how today, you know, with taking on projects, there is almost this, you know, we, they've eliminated the need for distributors because right. you're not talking about a physical product anymore. Distribution in the past used to be about taking physical CDs that were packaged, putting them in boxes, and shipping them off to stores for exactly. people to buy them. Pretty much like the clothing business or the shoe and business then product today. paying for product placement, and all those barriers have been removed, out the window. Completely removed today. Yeah, and so I thought also, too, the other points is that, you know, where they where they think about, you know, is it Spotify? Is it sync-driven? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and also... You know, the marketing department and how do they get more people? You know, I I thought what was really interesting as far as the sync part of the conversation, what he was talking about is that at the end of the day, the marketing departments from these film and TV departments, they're just looking for what can we do to sell this to get people in the seats at the theater? What is that going to take? So I thought that was a very interesting point. And what piece of music best sells their message? Absolutely. And and. The key thing I want to pick up on what you just said, which is very, very important, is that those kinds of musical decisions in marketing are not made by music supervisors. That whole world that you're speaking of, of trailers and and marketing, is made by marketing Marketing people people, who are an entirely different uh, set of so, people right. and they're an entirely they have entirely different budgets and they have entirely different creative needs which right. you've just spoken about right. you know how can this serve my intention of getting more people to see my film or watch my television show tomorrow exactly. night or whatever it is very very important the other thing that I think was really interesting Eric is you know when we, we spoke about the area of breaking acts on a worldwide level is, right. is that something that is a challenge for a company like his and he spoke about you know the Welshley Arms situation which I thought was really interesting picking that up from Vertigo Universal in Germany. Right. And it was that it was unintentional and there was a lot of good luck and timing. I guess it was it was really doing well in Spotify in Germany and the label reached out to them and they kind of worked that out and it just, you know, I think it went top 10. Yes, and, which is very difficult. And, and, you know, and they said that it was very not intentional. They weren't trying to make an effort. It was just they were getting fire in one thing and they kind of built it around there. And and I think to the credit to, to um, Germany, the the company that took them on in Germany that they just went straight to radio with it and they had a top 10 thing which typically would have not happened on an American label like a Republic or something here or they wouldn't take that kind of chance they would want to build it first and then take it to radio much later which, which because you can't right you can't just I mean unless you're a superstar you cannot just go to radio and say here's our new single exactly and so what Tyler got from that is he had a story right and there was no data to support it they were just getting that yeah i mean they had the initial data i guess that was going breaking in spotify in germany but uh yeah it was just a real interesting story how to take something that's happening and really take it to that next level and you've got a band now that's become a career act exactly and you're once you're able to do that in one territory it makes it a lot easier to spread that to france or to england or UK, to come to America exactly. to get press and all of those things. It, it's like, you know, we've, we've talked about this in the, in the all podcast. All it takes before. is one. All it takes is one. It just takes, whether it's one market, one A&R person, or one label. Hey, insiders. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. We really appreciate it. To get show notes, links, and everything that was mentioned during this interview, head on over to our official website at mubutv.com forward slash podcast forward slash show notes. If you're enjoying the content and what we're doing here on the show, please subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts from. And don't forget to rate and review our show over at iTunes. Five-star reviews 
reviews are always welcome and help to ensure that our podcast stands out on the top rated and new and noteworthy charts on iTunes in our space. You can also find us on social media at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all ending with the handle Mubu TV, which is spelled M-U-B-U TV. Don't forget to catch our flagship show, the Mubu TV Insider Video Series, airing every week on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Mubu TV. This show was produced and created by Rich Ezra and Eric Knight. This show would not be here if it weren't for our amazing team, which are the following. Interview editors, Sarah Nissenbaum and Alex Taylor. Show notes and transcriptions by Jani Chang, Nikoka Bodoglu, Lilia Owens, and Sarah Nissenbaum. Theme music by Disciples of Babylon. And be sure to tune in next week for another episode of the Mubu TV Insider Podcast.